as I think about acknowledging this country. So I want to give a shout out to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are out here in Zoom. I can see nearly everyone, but not everyone. And I know that you're all out there, wherever any of us are, we're on Aboriginal land. Some of you are home and some of you are far from home, but we're all on country. And we're all thinking about the shape and the textures of that country, the smell of the bush, the sound of the birds, it's all around us. So wherever you are, I wanna say hello to your country that you're sitting on at the moment too. I don't know, as I acknowledge country, you might wanna pop up in the chat an acknowledgement of where you are. And I see that some people are doing that now, which is such a beautiful, glorious thing to realize that Zoom gives us this virtual country that really is pretty amazing, that allows us to connect not only our stories, but our thoughts and connect our countries together. So I'm joining you here today. I'm coming from Wongal country, a country that now nourishes me in my imagination, in my heart, and physically as I look out my window, at all of the activity that's going on out there. You know, just out my window now, there's a butcher bird sitting in a tree and she's got a little something in there. And I know she's getting it ready for her babies that are up there. So here in this season of new generations and, and caring for our emerging, our emerging little young ones coming out onto country, I wanna say I acknowledge country and I acknowledge the beautiful future stories that are growing out before me. It's been absolutely amazing to sit here and watch everyone's beautiful faces and comments come up in our virtual Zoom land. And it's also very grounding to make me think about the actual country that's beyond here. So I wanna say thanks everyone for sharing this moment of acknowledgement with me today. And thanks for weaving together our stories. Thanks, Shankri. Thank you, Jennifer, for that warm and beautiful and generous acknowledgement. On behalf of the festival, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country from which this festival is being broadcast today, the Wongal, Bidjigal and Darug people, and acknowledge all nations, all First Nations people across Australia. I pay my respects to their elders and storytellers, past, present and emerging. The Boundless Festival was established by Writing New South Wales in 2017, as Australia's first festival featuring exclusively Indigenous and culturally diverse writers. This year's festival is happening online, making it accessible to a broader audience across the country. This year's festival is also different because it has been programmed by three curators participating in the Writing New South Wales Emerging Curators Program under the guidance of Sisonke Misimang. Thank you, Sasanke, for your expert steering of that program. We're so lucky to have you. The curators selected for the program are Zora Ali, Annie Brockenhuschak, and Tina Huang. In curating the 2021 Boundless Festival, they are joined by Jungan Woman, editor, creative producer, and one of my favorite storytellers, Phoebe Grainer. Together, these four curators have developed such an exciting program. Thank you. We'd also like to thank the Bankstown Arts Centre as co-presenters of the festival since its foundation, particularly Vandana Ram and her team. There are many, many people and organisations who've supported the festival. Thank you to the funding bodies, the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund, Create New South Wales and Australia Council. Their essential funding has made it possible to offer a program like this for free. Thank you also to Writing New South Wales staff for all their hard work on the festival, particularly Program Director Julia Salas and Project and Communications Officer Martin Reyes. And finally, I'd like to encourage all of you in our wonderful community of storytellers to enjoy a weekend of conversations, events, inspiration and insights. Tony Morrison writes, I stood at the border. I stood at the edge and claimed it as central. I claimed it as central and let the rest of the world move over to where I was. 
That's what this festival is about to me. All of us claiming and reclaiming the centrality, the power and the value of our stories. The first session called Future Storytelling is curated by Phoebe Grainer, who is joined by Shari Sebbins, Amy Soule, Dylan Vandenberg and Delara Williams. Enjoy. And Abby Lee Lewis. And Abby Lee Lewis. Sorry, Abby. All right. Thank you, Shikari. Thank you, Annie Jennifer, for that beautiful welcome to country. Um, like yourself, I am far away from mine. So I would like to um, do an acknowledgement. You know, I'm not from this land. My lands are in the Mularidji and Kukajangan country in up in far north Queensland. Um, so I would like to acknowledge that each of us are coming from different lands today. And um, I know that, you know, I'm here on beautiful Gadigal land, which has been my home for the past seven years. It's, um, it's looked after me and it's kept me safe. And I would pay my respects to the Gadigal elders, past, present and emerging. And may their stories that they tell to their children and their grandchildren be told for millennia to come. So firstly, I would like to um, introduce the panelists. So on the panel today, we have Delara Williams. Delara Williams graduated from the National Institute of Dramatic Art in 2017. Delara made her feature film debut in Wayne Blair's Top End Wedding, which premiered at the 2018 Sundance Film Festival. And she has recently completed production on her follow-up feature, Victoria Woolf's McIntyre's The Flood. Her recent television credits include Get Kraken and the third and fourth series of Black Comedy for the ABC. Delara short film credits include Last Drinks at Frida's, which premiered at the 2017 Sydney Film Festival. Her stage credits include Exit the King with Redline Productions, Black Ties with Ilbidgery Theatre, which toured both Australia and New Zealand, Rainbow's End with Darlinghurst Theatre, William Boga Yaringa with Balboa Street Theatre, and Blackie Blackie Brown for the Sydney Theatre Company and the Malthouse Theatre. Whilst at NIDA, her stage credits include Realism, Love and Money, The Season of Sarsaparilla, and The Twelfth Night. She has also awarded the Hazel Tariq Shakespeare Award during her time at NIDA. This year, Delara's written play, uh, The Lookout, which was picked up by Mugulin Theatre Company as a part of their biannual writing festival, Yellow Monday Festival. Prior to NIDA, Delara studied at the Aboriginal, studied Aboriginal theatre at the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts and performed in Crow Bones and Carnivals. She also poor, uh, performed in The Shadow King, a reworking of Shakespeare's tragedy, King Lear, as a part of the Darwin Festival. Her professional acting debut was starring in TV adaption of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Please welcome Delara Williams. Next on our panel is Amy Soule. Amy Soul is a proud Wiradji Waramai person. Amy is a playwright, director, activist, actor, and producer. They completed their Master of Theatre Playwriting at the Victorian College of the Arts in 2020 and are currently undertaking their Master of Fine Arts and Directing at the National Institute of Dramatic Arts. Amy also graduated from, acting, from the acting program at the Academy of Film, Theatre, and Television in 2018. In 2020, Amy was assistant director for Rent at the Sydney Opera House, directed and directed a reading of Dylan Vandenberg's play way back when at Darlinghurst Theatre Company. As a playwright, Amy is currently under commission with Ilbidgery Theatre Company's playwright program and Yardstick Theatre's COBRA response. In 2019, they wrote and directed and produced Doing at the King's Cross Theatre and were a member of the KXT Step Up program. As an activist, Amy is primarily a attracted to decolonized work in the industry, and they are the Equity Diversity Committee co-chair. They are the co-founder of Puddle and Pond Theatre Company and have vast productions and rehearsal room associate experience with Yalamundi National First People's Playwriting Festival, Darlinghurst Theatre Company, Green Door Theatre Company, and Bakehouse Theatre. Amy is a passionate performer and creator who is devoted to creating theatre that is inclusive to all and full of magic. Please welcome Amy Soul. Next on our panel is Abby Lee Lewis. Abby Lee Lewis is a Kalkadoon woman born on Arida country and grew up in Western Australia. 
In 2008, she graduated from the Ab Aboriginal Theatre course at Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts. In 2009, she worked with the Iriakan Theatre Company during the play called Talk It Up by David Milroy. In 2010, Abby Lee was accepted into the three-year acting course at the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts and graduated in 2012. Since moving to Sydney, Abby Lee has worked with Belk Shakespeare Company during their edu educational program, The Players. She was then asked to come back in 2017 to perform in the edu educational main stage production of Macbeth. In early 2017, Abby Lee worked on the original work by Sienna Van Helton, Fallen, uh, produced by Sport for Jove. In 2019, Abby Lee starred as Emily in the Black Swan production of Our Town that saw three First Nation performers at the heart of it. In recent years, Abby Lee has begun to develop a passion for directing and theatre making and has sought to further her development of the craft by assisting directing. Abby Lee has assistant, assisted on main stage shows like Hamlet, produced by Belle Shakespeare in 2020, directed by uh, Peter Evans, as well as the production of Charlie Pilgrim in 2018 by the Australian Theatre for Young People. In 2022, we will see Abby Lee directing her uh, directing in her um, the debut in Cutter in Cute, written by Bruce Pascoe and produced by Morgan Theatre Company. Early this year, Avili performed in Belle Shakespeare's national tour of Midsummer's Night Dream. Currently, she is performing in IDA in The Bleeding Tree, written by Angus Serini, directed by Ian Michaels, and produced by Blue Room Theatre. Please welcome Avili Lewis. Next up, we have Dylan Vandenberg. Dylan Vandenberg is a Palawa playwright originally from northeast of Tasmania. His recent works include Milk, which won the Nick Enright Prize for playwriting at the New South Wales Premier Literary Awards and is published by Currency Press, and Way Back When, which won the Griffin Award for New Australian Writing. He is currently a resident artist at Griffin and a member of the Sydney, of the Sydney Theatre Company's Emerging Writers Group. Please welcome Dylan Vandenberg. Um, so again, my name is Phoebe Grainer. I'm a Kukajung and Mularidji Jalabu from far north Queensland. And I'm an actor, writer, creative producer and playwright. And I'll be chairing today's panel. So thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for joining and everyone else, wherever you're zooming in from today. And welcome everyone to the Future Storytelling Panel. So the reason I have brought you all together today is because I want to have a conversation, ask the questions, what is Indigenous storytelling now, in the past, in the future? What are the stories we need to tell? What stories are we telling now and wanting to tell? And how are our stories changing and evolving? As the First Nations people of this country, storytelling has been a part of us for millennia, and we need to continuously discuss with each other about our storytelling because it is the stories we share to each other and to the wider community that speak to our political and social issues of our times. It is what teaches and creates critical thinking. Our stories are about the experiences that we have, individual and community. It is the stories that tell us about ourselves, our, our people, our future and our culture. Stories tell us about our culture and there can only be culture if there are people. People make the culture and culture and people are forever changing and moving, just like stories, just like how your mom or your dad or your grandfather or grandmother would tell you stories, how you now might tell those stories that you heard once to others. It is always moving and moving and changing is what leads us into the future. Stories are vital and important to us. It is stories that keep our culture alive and thriving, keeps our people alive and thriving now and for years to come for the ones after us. So that no matter how many years pass, they know where they came from. These amazing artists that are speaking with us today are the new generations of Australian storytellers. These people and their stories matter to the world. And I just wanna say, I see all of you and I see the great talent that you guys have and your contribution to Australian literature and Australian storytelling. So thank you, all incredible First Nation storytellers. So first up, I would like to, I'm gonna ask Delara this question. 
Delara, so, you know, inter in an interview this year about, you know, your first play that you had written, The Lookout, uh, which showcased at the Alamanda Festival, which I might add is, you know, an amazing feat, you said you really wanted to start the story based on your connection to people, the ocean, what it means to be in these places and what comes out of being in these places. Through that connection that you spoke about, what is Aboriginal storytelling and what does it mean to you? And what do you think storytelling was before? Um, I knew you were going to ask me first. <laughs> <I was like>. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's the whole thing. It's like where that is our history, like oral history. It's a thing that's sort of why we continue. And so it's something that we're really good at. Um, and Aboriginal theatre obviously changes with the climates of where we are in time. And like, especially through the seventies with black theatre, um, uh, the very political charged um, aspects of their views and, and who they wanted to share it to. Mm -hmm. um, and now the, the different climates that are coming up and what we're questioning, um, especially myself um, is, connecting with each other and decentering whiteness or yeah. the colonization. And because I, I believe it's a lot of us is trying to explain our existence to others. Um, and I wanted to explore going back and explaining our existence to ourselves and what that means and, and things that are that exists to this day, whether or not um, settlement happens. And that's the thing that I wanted to explore is to remind that even though these buildings and all this stuff that's happened in history is that connection to land and collect connection to each other is still so strong and still thriving. Right, what an awesome answer. Amy Soul, I'm gonna ask you the same question. In particular, you shared your thoughts in an article about your play, Doing. You said you wanted to share stories truthfully and authentically. What does that mean to you in the context of Aboriginal storytelling? What is truthfulness and authentic authenticity in terms of- Oh, hey, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Just for you. <laughs> Uh, so I think it's like uh, the center of my practice. Like I think as a black artist, what I do is truth telling. I don't know necessarily fully understand or to comprehend what it means yet, but I know that it's based in my family, my community, my responsibility as a black artist. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about authentically expressing everything it is to be me to be like, I'm a black human, I'm a queer human, I'm a non-binary human. And so I have to show up in space and bravely tell all of my stories and all of the paths that I've walked so that then I can also allow space for everyone else in my communities to do so. And I think that at the base of that is my blackness and my spirit and my ancestors and my dreaming being like, hey, you, you've got this thing to do. You need to go turn up and you need to go tell the truth because we've got to shed light on things and we've got to grow and create spaces. I think that's what it is. Mm. I haven't fully, fully developed it as my practice. I'm still, you know, I'm 31 and I'm figuring it out, and getting there. But I think it's really important that we show up in all that we are and we don't hide anything because like what Delara was saying too, like a reflection of that, it's time for us to stop hiding the parts that we're too scared to even share with ourselves like yeah we're going to share those stories share like we've got to take those spaces and be the fullest biggest versions of who we are we can't shrink yeah yeah I love that sharing stories yeah and being honest uncomfortably being... honest <laughs> yeah yeah definitely definitely Abby, with your work, it takes you, you know, all around Australia, both in the city and in remote places, you know, through your experience, what is Aboriginal storytelling for you? Uh, just like echoing everything that Amy and Delara have said, but I also think 
I look at stories every, every time I pick up a book no matter what type of book it is um it could be written in Europe it could be um it could be complete fantasy or it could be sci-fi any book that I pick up I'm constantly um I, I look at it as putting it through my filter and my filter is black um yeah. and I see stories as myself and so I'm always bringing myself to stories um regardless of where they're set where they're written who <laughs> who's written them and so for me that's what storytelling is that's what black storytelling is is it's looking and viewing the world the way I do it and that is my culture that is my people that is the um the people that I meet it is all of it encompassing and I I'm really excited to see the future of Australian theatre because there are so many Indigenous, First Nations, um, Blackfellas that are sitting there and they're going to tell their stories and they're going to be telling it through their lens. Um, and, yeah, that excites me. Yeah, that excites me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan, you know, your stories have been everywhere around the country recently, you know. Congratulations to you, Deadly, my brother. I would like to ask you the same question. What is Aboriginal story to you? What does it mean to you? Um, to me, I mean, I think Aboriginal storytelling has always been about making sense of the world and kind of, you know, sharing culture and traditions and um, particularly, um, you know, during, um, you know, the ongoing um, period of colonization that we, you know, still still within at the moment, um, you know, Blackfellas have always told stories to kind of try and understand what's happening. And I think that we do that now. Um, and, and I think that we're constantly reevaluating what it is to be uh, an Aboriginal person in us in this country we, we call Australia. Um, and and we are recently kind of at, at this stage where um, we're allowed to tell stories in a different way than we have before. I think for a long time, you know, when when Blackfellas started creating theatre, you know, there was a lot of there were a lot of restrictions around the stories we were allowed to tell. Um, you know, the way we were supposed to tell them, the content and the, the themes. And now, you know, we're allowed to move beyond, um, you know, things based on our trauma and we're allowed to create worlds and we're allowed to be funny and we're allowed to, you know, um, to tell our stories in, you know, the, the, in a way that reflects the vibrancy and uniqueness of, of each and every one of us. Um, so to me, um, Aboriginal storytelling is about um, making sense of what's happening, but also standing on the shoulders of and extending the conversations that our ancestors started, you know, thousands of years ago as well. Amazing. I love that. Abby, you, you said once, you know, about your work, you said, um, you know, you wanted to, and you continue to give back in your work, you know, with that giving back, what, what stories are we giving back? And what are the stories do you think that we are telling I centre my work around um, inspiring and empowering. So I always kind of throw back to uh, myself and the schools that I grew up in and um, I kind of, um, my audiences, people um, like us that grew up in these schools that didn't, that weren't really designed for us. And so I... <laughs> my work or the work that I'm really excited to do is is teaching and the only way I know how to teach is through stories and so um I guess yeah I guess I I, I want to do that I want to and empower and inspire um kids from all over Australia regardless of you know and even regardless of what nationality because for me it's about showcasing um our stories in a way that's um educating I think mm. um and sometimes that educating isn't uh palatable <laughs> um you know not hiding the truth from from even from a you know a young age um but making it so it's um uh how do I put this making it so everyone can kind of understand and empathize yeah with with that version of education because for for me I didn't get taught that education at school and I'm sure it's a very similar for everyone else um 
you know, growing up in schools in the 80s and 90s, um, there was only one type of um, history that was being taught. And so for me, I want to keep continuing to unpack that. And the only way I know how to do is through te- yeah, going in and sharing stories, basically. Yeah. I don't know if I answered the question properly. <laughs> no, I, I love that. And I think, you know, I think that's so important that we, you know, tell the truth and not kind of hide our experiences. And I love what you were saying, Dylan, about, you know, that we are allowed to kind of, um, you know, move and tell our stories in a different kind of way. You know, what what do you think, you know, in terms of what stories we're telling? What do you think they they are saying about us and about our connection to country and people now compared to before? I think that um, the stories that white Australia wanted us to tell for so long were about this kind this pre-colonial idea of what we were like, what our culture was like. And our stories now, um, uh, you know, are, are allowed to reflect, um, you know, the, the, the evolution of ourselves and our culture, you know, um, it's culture isn't a static thing, it does change, there are connections that will, will never disappear. Um, uh, but, you know, the way that we we relate to um, to country and culture is different. We live in a globalized world, you know. Um, you know, I live away from home, um, you know, and I have for a long time, and um, it's difficult. But you know, it doesn't it doesn't lessen that connection in any way. Um, so we're allowed to tell stories that 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 kind of um, you know present a, a modern um, indigeneity on stage. It's that we we're, we're complex. Um, that we have to straddle two worlds and you know that's a burden and it's it's exhausting at times but um, it's also an incredible skill you know black fellows have been adapting for so long um, yeah. and we're allowed to, to you know reflect that now in the stories that we're telling on stage yeah definitely Delara you know you you, you work in film and theater and you know you create stories for both those different um, art forms what, where do you think we are at as a people in our storytelling? Like, where do you think, you know, how far have we come, do you think? Um, I'm not sure, really. Like, there is, there is aspects that we, we have come really far, but it's, it's really seeing what lens we're looking in and who the audience is. Um, the reason why I started writing is as a performer, I had to really question of why am I allowing myself and putting my soul and spirit and body through trauma mm. every night through the entertainment of white people. Mm. That was a really big thing of going, why am I doing this? And it wasn't a reason why I got into acting in the first place. Like, I think I was speaking to Shari Sebbins and I was like, I didn't watch Rabbit Proof Fence and said, I want to be an actor. I watched other things like what Abby was saying about sci-fi and love stories mm-hmm. and this sort of um, escapism and exploring things um, mm-hmm. outside of this tragedy of what Australia tries to paint us. And that there's only one side of the story that we're telling and a lot of it is tragedy or trauma and not a lot of celebrating. Um, I always say that we've been here for 120,000 years or so mm-hmm. and that's still being discovered um, and we're only focusing on 150 of colonization stories mm-hmm. and I want to see where those stories before that and the magicness and and the beauty of who we are as as these people across the land and how diverse and different we are we're not under this umbrella of aboriginal because that is the term that's given to us to as a collective but we are so different and to embrace mm-hmm. our differentness with each other um it's slowly getting there um mm-hmm. I just I want to see those those big major uh, chances and jumps that I'm hearing the others say that they're doing is um, really exciting and something that I'm looking forward to. And yeah, I think it's just changing the focus of who your audience, who you're telling these stories to. Yeah, is it yeah. to the colony or is it to your people in the mm-hmm. sense of if we're sitting there and through that entertainment of stage and film 
and you're being traumatized mm. is that really for that for your people mm. to allow them to sit and be re-traumatized or do you want to sit there and and this sense of empowerment and love and light and celebration that they are reminded how wonderful and beautiful we are um, yeah 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 we are a wonderful and beautiful people and our stories are wonderful and beautiful thank you for that answer amy you know you talk about your theater making and your storytelling and you know you always you often say you know it being about magic you know there's this kind of beautiful kind of um you know it's at a higher kind of place you know where do you think you know with the stories that us as first nation writers and storytellers you know how in what ways do you think we are telling our stories and do you think we are telling them in the right ways mm, that's big mm. um I'll come, to, <laughs> I'll come to the magic thing first so the magic is the word that I use because probably because in my language I don't have the word for what it is right so I use a white man's word to describe my understanding of dreaming and spirit my understanding of my connection to country my understanding of like the deep spiritual connection that we have as mob and the knowings that we have that white fellas mm -hmm. cannot comprehend yeah like you are the mob out here from different cultures like you get it and you kind of reflect it and you can see it in us but like mm -hmm. white fellas walk around like this is it I'm like you don't understand <laughs> you don't understand the stories the history you don't understand what we're holding mm -hmm. like and that's why you're burning the world down um yeah just a whole and I think that that kind of also <laughs> comes back to I agree with the, what Delara is saying and like the variations of a story is my practice I do like yelling at white people. <laughs> it's part of who I am in space. Part of me in space is doing two things, correcting and yelling at white people and educating them and holding space for the, the diversity and complexities of other communities, both mine and, and the intersections of disability, of transness, of queerness, and then other POC humans. Me being like, this is, I have a responsibility as a black human and a storyteller and um a hopefully a future black leader as long as my community doesn't <laughs> decide that I'm gammon and get rid of me um to hold space to other people's stories yep. to sit here and be like you're a part of this you're welcome you're not I mean they always will and that's the thing that breaks me with storytelling right that's the thing that breaks me about our culture is like I can get angry at white people but we always hold space for them and they still fuck it up mm. <laughs> uh so my thing about stories is there's a there's a there's a, an array of what with the work that we are doing and why mm -hmm. we are doing it but to think that we are just telling stories because we just love stories is a simplicity of the the connection that like black fellas have to story like we're doing an array of different things and we're working on multiple different levels and yeah. we've all got our missions and we're fighting hard we are working 10 times harder than anybody else. Yeah. Like, look at those bios. Like, we do not stop because we cannot stop because we have got things to do. We've got old people to make proud and we've got people to support. We've got change to make. Yes. Um, and we've got a responsibility to our land, to our country, to our people. And it's stories, the form that those of us in this room have taken. I think that answers it. Tell me wow. if it doesn't. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> just wow, I love that. Abby, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think 100% like I, there's also, and I think the something that keeps coming up is this responsibility, this cult, like cultural um, responsibility to our people, um, to, um, yeah to the diversity of countries that we have and and I think that's so important as well Delara I just want to echo that is that um we aboriginality or aboriginal or first nations or is, is not just a blanket term we are so complex there are mm -hmm. so many different countries um you know and as someone who hasn't actually grown up on country and has um you know and has grown up in all these different countries and I'm I've been quite transient my whole life and mm. so I have always felt um kind of 
outside of watching my own culture, which has always been a really interesting thing because I I felt like, and it's it's that adapting thing, is like I felt like I've taken bits and other bits and people's um, culture really to learn and try and identify with my own. Yeah. Um, and and I think there's this weird thing that even though I haven't grown up on country, I always felt that responsibility. Any story that I told, I'm and always acknowledging that it's not not my story because that's not my country. Mm-hmm. Um, even even these even these stories that I've grown up with aren't my stories. Mm-hmm. They've I but what what's happened is that I have actually um have uh, cast myself in these stories and so because there are parts of them that I do identify and that magic um um that magic that you speak of Amy is uh, like I and I talk about it as like these uh, growing up I've always known always known that I was a black fella always knew that I knew who my mob was like um you know always always known but never really well I never had a name for the connection that I had and so I've you know I've always been drawn to magic in you know in a white western world and then it wasn't till our theater that I've gone actually no that magic that I was interested has is in me and and is in my people and is in the people that I'm meeting all these black fellas this is something you cannot no one can understand that in our blood there's this this yeah magic like yeah I gotta find a better word for it but there's yeah. something energy or that we have and it's when I woke up this morning and I there was a crow outside my window and it's sitting there screaming at me to wake up and I'm sitting there going what does that crow want like yeah that way of thinking or that way of connecting I yeah. you can't can't really put words to it and maybe when I learn my own language and things like that I might find the word but yeah. You, I don't I don't know if the Western world really understands that mm. um and so when storytelling and and meeting with mob and and all this sort of stuff is for me it's releasing it you're mm. releasing energy you're putting taking the valve off it um yeah. so yeah echoing both Delara and Amy there's just this Western world does doesn't understand yeah <laughs> telling for me is just yeah releasing that educating um other people and maybe in hopes that they can understand that we are not just one we're human we're we're human we can like we can hate we can um you know dream like we're not just one blanket thing and our storytelling now I think is reflecting that just we need more though we need yes (laughs) yes 100 percent and, you know, I think, you know, everyone here is just amazing at, you know, just discussing and, and knowing what we, what we want and what we want to put on stages. You know, you know, Delara, with your, your play The Lookout, you know, it's, it has that magical realism. It, it kind of has that, um, you know, something that's a part of our culture interwoven in a very, very kind of modern way where, you know, audiences and who, who live in, you know, 2021, can understand but also they're understanding and they're learning about aboriginal culture in your story you know what how important is that for you to kind of carry that on yeah (laughs) 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 Uh, Vivi was in the development and understood uh, why I decided to focus around time Um, and also Blackfella's idea of what time is and how we view the world and that was the biggest thing of um, the writing the lookout is that it's this place and these young Aboriginal kids are talking about things like space-time continuance and well if you know the equivalent of space-time continuance is the dreaming mm. and it's the whole thing of like we already talk about this stuff and we've been talking about this stuff for century about how we use time and how we use stars and everything and only mm. science is only now catching up or putting these what Amy says is putting white words to things that we've known for centuries yeah and, yeah. and that's how we talk and we should be allowed to talk um, about that stuff and and that we are smarter than what this colony has been giving to like been trying to brainwash us mm. into thinking that we're other mm. and so 
what I, I really wanted to focus of empowering, especially I'm saying young, like I'm not young, but no. <laughs> the young one. <laughs> uh, so imagine that the, what we keep saying, that the complexity of thoughts and, mm-hmm. and the, the great thing about Aboriginal storytelling is constantly reminding ourselves of why we're here and our mission to be here and our mission is to connect. It's the whole thing of like, especially tribals, like we just did not con- connect within our tribe. We connected with others. Yep. And that's what ceremony is. And what we do with ceremony is to tell stories so they can go on and, and have this beautiful understanding, this relationship between each other. And I think that's the sort of modern take of what I try to write. Mm-hmm. Also jumping through time, which was just a <sighs> never <Amazing>. again. <laughs> But in the use of like parallel universes and and every decision we make then has repercussions, which is what folklore does and what our dreaming yeah. stories do anyways, is that your decisions now can yeah. hold responsibility and weight that not yeah. only affects you, but affects the people around you, it affects land and everything yeah. that we are all in this together. And yes. I think that's the biggest thing I try to explore with the lookout. Yeah. Well said, deadly woman. Dylan, you know, you said, um, I was reading an article on you and, you know, you said, Sorry. yeah, I was, I was reading a few on you and it said, you know, what inspires you. And You said yarns from your family and your friends and snatches of conversations overheard, you know, with that in mind and how you create story and what, you know, engages you and what generates you. What do you think, Dylan Vandenberg, is our future stories? Ah, uh, ah. Um, well, <laughs> great question. I'm hoping my sausage dog chimes in with something particular. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I think the future of our stories are, um, are limitless. I think. Uh, you know, I think I think we have. So as Solara was saying, I think that we've made some headway in some areas. And certainly, you know, in the theatre, we can write the stories we want, but there are still gatekeepers that exist who might not let us put them on. Um, so there's there's a lot there's a, a way to go in terms of you know the institutions and organisations who are producing work in this country. Um, yeah. You know, for example, to talk about my own work, um, you know, some of it has received a lot of recognition, but no one's willing to actually put it on stage. And um, you know. Uh, I think that we, mm-hmm. you know, we need to be having conversations about why. Um, yep. And 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 I think people are interested in us. Yes, stories. we do. <laughs> people are interested in our stories. Um, but the, yeah, the future is limitless. I think we're going to be seeing, you know, stories that jump through time. We're going to be seeing stories um, about black fellas um, in space. We're going to be seeing, you know, this this variety of of of, of um, things that still comment on our connection to country, culture, family and so on um and and you know we, we will still see stories that you know um are about our responsibility to elders and family you know some mm. of my plays are you know milk was a play written um to kind of document my um, great grandmother's experience growing up on flinders island and stories mm. that she told me because my partner was pregnant and i was going oh my god i want this story to you know to to um live on in a way that's kind of um, yeah, you know, something that she could be proud of and something my daughter could be proud of. Um, yeah. And so there will still be that. But um, certainly the way that that I was able to tell that story, which was kind of three ancestors in a metaphysical space talking across time, you know, that's something that we're allowed to do now. And it's kind of seen as, you know, part of the beauty of, of Black storytelling is that we're not bound by these kind of conventions of, you know, the mm. three act structure and so on. Um, yeah. and, and I believe that we're, you know, the theatre is the best forum for um, Black fellows to tell our stories because it's oral, because it's in front of an audience, because it's different every time. Um, and I think that we're, we're going to, you know, embrace that. Fantastic. Oh, the man, that just got me so motivated and inspired just now. <laughs> oh, great. You know, Amy, you, you know, you have two master degrees now. Big educational one. <laughs> what in terms of, you know, future storytelling, how might, how do you think, how might that change our narrative as a people and how might it change our storytelling?
Yeah, so I think the top of you, yeah, the start of your question answers the back of your question. I do have two masters. I'm, <laughs> um, I dropped out of school when I was 13. Mm-hmm. I basically didn't go like, you know, this, my nan didn't go, my mum didn't go, I didn't go, you know, mm. I had trauma to deal with, I had shit to do, I, had, I couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I stayed out of the system fully. I did mm-hmm. not go in the white system at all. I had a, I was like, nah, there's something wrong with that. I'm not doing that. And mm. then I went off and I walked my own path and I got back into education through uh, the UPUG, the UPUG program at Wallatooka up there, which is like a indigenous enabling program, which got me into um, back into kind of learning, but it was fully black and it was just black elders sitting in space, supporting me and telling me mm. and teaching me. And then I got into acting and then I found, so I kind of had the education that I had was in storytelling yeah um my understanding of life is storytelling Mm. um and my yeah so I think that for me that's a part of it on the back of what Dylan was saying it's black ways of being yeah in space and existing and that's what it is that is the future the future is not the system the future is our ways of being our ways of working our ways of telling story and our ways of leading and holding space and our elders and I think that we all 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 of us all every single person here's work um all the deadly panelists uh we do a (laughs) meta level of doing this every time we do our work every time we do our work we do a bit of this on the meta level where we're like "Mm, we're just gonna make it so it's this way and you're all just gonna learn a bit (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I think it's time that we start really start. I'm the research work that I'm doing and I intend to do my PhD on is articulating yeah. black form um, yeah. and black storytelling and not as in a homogenized Western way of understanding, but like as just starting to look at things and what we can do so I can support other black storytellers being like, if we can articulate to them that it's this, then yeah. they've got the money and that's how we'll find the way to do the things that we need to do. Because as Dylan was saying, those blocks at the moment, those gatekeepers, those mm. the the colony the funding it's a problem and it's a problem for us as a collective like as a collective culture like for all of us for everyone in this room it is a problem that our stories are not centered that our stories aren't funded that our stories aren't given space to be the truth of what they are culturally yeah um, we've got work ahead of us or our stories don't make money mm. So, like, the, and, and, the, and this true. is true. Oh, well, it's <laughs> not true at all, but it's, a, but it's this thing saying. of, like, you're looking at companies that, that are going, okay, what, what shows are going to make us money? What mm-hmm. shows, um, what actors are going to make us the biggest money? Or, of course, it's going to be a name. Okay, mm-hmm. well, um, we can't get a black fella name because they're off doing other projects because we're a minority in our own country so even in storytelling so okay so what we're going to do is we might rejig and put on a different story so we can get a name in and there's an abundance of white actors so what we're going to do is we're going to get a white actor and tell a white story and Mm -hmm. so it's a it's a recurring circle because and and it's understandable companies need to make money in order to survive we live in a capitalist world but Mm -hmm. what needs to happen is these gatekeepers that are up there they need to be black they need to be black gatekeepers because then what's going to happen is they're going to fight for us and they're going to fight for our stories Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. exactly but it's also fucking yeah like they need to make money i get it but when old mate artistic director is on two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and he's not given any space to black work because he's real scared about how his finances look i'm like think about yourself and what you're doing in your society like no that's not it be an artist yeah yeah i love this passion and I, I love how, you know, that it drives us in our storytelling. And I think it's so important to have that energy because we need that energy because, you know, our elders before, you know, they've done their work. And, you know, now it's our time to, you know, take that energy. Yeah, Delara, you wanted to Yeah, I just want to add on that. Yeah, I totally agree. Because what it is, is that they already have a perceived idea about us and a way that we are that has been shown through media through centuries and what's been spoken of that we are this way so when we break out of that narrative Mm. they cannot comprehend that we act and we think different than how they have already viewed us that we are alcoholics that we are domestic that we are all this and we are poor and so when you then go oh 
can, we can be in space and we can be this and stuff. They really can't comprehend that our mind, because we're still other to them. We're still yeah. flora and fauna, mm -hmm. whether it is they acknowledge it or not, because it's only been, we've been acknowledged only for 50 years, really, mm. uh, that we, uh, we can think beyond what they can comprehend because they've always been the idea of superior than us. So when we then come in and step into that role of that going, you're wrong, or we don't think like that, they really can't comprehend that. And so that's why they gatekeep because it's like, you, we don't fit their narrative, mm -hmm. whatever we're writing and stuff. And it's the whole thing of trying to convince them that we're yeah. different or we're not what you think we are. Yeah. And I think too, you know, um, in the last few decades, we have really just kind of progressed in our storytelling in a great way. And, you know, there's amazing things out there. And, you know, that energy from our, you know, our grandparents and the ones before that, they, you know, they made that so that's possible for us. And, you know, with this, with this new kind of work that is happening at the moment, and, you know, Abby, you know, you're, you're going to be debuting, you know, in your first directorial kind of position with Uncle Bruce Pascoe's um, play, Cutter and Cuda. You know, that's amazing and, and fantastic. Um, what stories do you want? Um, I, what stories do I want? I playful I don't know like I want I want to be able to dream I want to be able to um inspire and encourage other people to play to um I love kids work like I love working on kids shows um and so I am really um and, and and the reason why is because we we can dream we're our mate and, and the imaginations of kids just is like F, like epic and so for me I they their their biases aren't there yet they're mm -hmm. they're still figuring stuff out they're still imagine um imagining and so for me I want to do that like I want to go all right well let's what what if adults just played just let go of all of our freaking biases and just played and that's one one thing reason why I took to acting it was because like I wanted to play I wanted to imagine I wanted to dream it didn't matter it didn't matter what box I was in I could do all the boxes yeah. um and so I that's what I want to do I want to I want to do that I want to go okay well don't put me in a box don't put kids in a box don't put mm. um I I want to I, I, I want to do it all yeah <laughs> like, I want to do it all I want to I want to be a um explore dark things themes in terms of like supernatural I want to look at the light and the bright I want to look at um the colorful and maybe the black and white like yep. I I I don't know yeah I just we're and it's that thing that Delara was saying was that yeah we've been viewed as one way for so long and my mm. upbringing has been not exactly that you know like I haven't yeah. um I've walked in a world in two worlds where um I I had the privilege to dream a little you know I had uh, I could read I could um you know imagine and so I have I've been brought up with this idea of like why not why yeah. not and um I want to give that to other people I want to give yeah. that to you know kids anywhere um you know I want to give them to communities up in the you know up north and all those you know all those kids that might not be able to uh, have the ability to dream yeah but also taking and and I think I think it's this thing as well as that I'm as I'm learning and growing of decolonizing my own version of what that is yep. so um, you know, I, I, and kid, you know, not saying that kids out bush don't dream, but it might just be my understanding or a different way of dreaming, you know, like, yeah. um, not talking about our dreaming, but <laughs> actually yeah, sleeping dreams. and dreaming, um, yeah. you know, and so, you know, and maybe even exploring that, I was like, okay, what, what do you have to share and, and bringing that to the wider audience, yeah, um, definitely. would be exciting, you know, um, I totally totally agree and I love that notion of dreams and you know really just being able to explore you know 
Delara, in your work, in your film work that I have read, you know, you explore so much and you explored, as you said, these different times and different decades that, you know, these Black people have lived and, you know, experienced. What stories do you want, Delara Williams? I'm a hopeless romantic, so love, <laughs> Black love, just connection of people and wanting, like, desire and, yeah, because I feel like we just never, like, majority of Aboriginal women in media are the most like is rape culture like the, the thing is that's what has always been shown we've mm. never been seen as desirable and and people to love mm -hmm. um, and we're always this sort of fighter and strong willed and which we are because we are a matriarch and but we also deserve love and deserve to be loved and and that's one of my biggest, like you've read some of my stuff. <laughs> it's all <laughs> just romance. And I'm more than happy to, like, I feel like a lot of political aspects are always been uh, like held in very strong hands. And I'm like, you do you. Yeah. I will just, let me stay with romance for a bit. But yeah. they're the biggest things that I would love to explore and I want to see more. Yeah. Um, more black love. Yeah, definitely. And love between everybody, different cultures and culture coming together and just yep. connection is what drives me to write. Yeah, love that. Amy Soul, next year you're going to be putting on your new play and you're going to be directing it. So excited for you. What an amazing thing to happen in a career. And I just want to ask you, Amy Soul, what stories do you think we need? Yeah, so this is interesting because uh, the story that I am centering that I'm directing next year, which is called Burning, everyone can come see it. It'll be my grad show for NIDA. Um, yes, please come. It is about the rape of Aboriginal women um, because that's my lived experience. My lived experience is of that continual rape of my body, of my country, of my family. Um, and it's something we don't talk about, that it's a shared experience, that when you have been perceived as the absolute, absolutely nothing at mm. the bottom, as this, you know, colonial culture has done to Black women, um, it's a part of all of our stories in some way. Like, I don't think I've ever met a sister that it's, that it's not. Mm. But the problem is, is we've never been able to tell those stories from our way, from our mm. empowered way. We yep. tell it for them so they can look at it. So the story mm. that I wrote was, no, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm living and I'm living because of the women who have come before me and the women who stand with me and from my mum and my aunties and my people and my sisters, like that's the truth of it. The truth of it is the most powerful, important thing that we have in this land is black women um, and the matriarchy and the importance of that and the importance of like showcasing that and showcasing what that means. Um, so my story was about telling the story in a way that was empowered and not objectifying. It was a story about I'm going to share and storytell and heal with my people, mm -hmm. not be, not have an audience be voyeuristic of my experience and my culture. Yeah. Um, and I think it's that it's empowered storytelling at this, at the heart of it, black, 100% of theatre works in this country should be black. Anyone who's talking about diversity as inclusion is not understanding that. <laughs> um, and then I've always said everything should be black and then we offer the space to everyone else. Then yeah. we open up our hearts and offer those space to diversity and understanding. That's how it should function. And then that's what it is. And that's what the, then the intersections are in the community. And that's how we do healing collectively for everything. Um, so I think that's what I want the future of storytelling to be. I mean, all you mob, like forever, like I <laughs> want to see all your shows. Um, but yeah, I, I want the future of storytelling to be black led, black empowered and mm -hmm. black people and black fellas empowering everyone else yeah. to share their part and their story and not from a vieweristic white lens. Yeah. Oh, that just motivates me and make me like feel like I'm just, yeah, just ready, just ready. You know, Come to my show because it'll be deadly. <laughs> yes, yes, everyone go to the show. Um, it's next year. You can find tickets on the National Institute of Dramatic Arts website. Amy Soul. Dylan, you, you know, you once described your um, writing style in three words as playful, strange, lyrical. 
you know, with that in mind and that type of freedom, you know, what, what do you think, Dylan Vandenberg? What, what do you think our future stories look like? And who do you think they are speaking to? I think that, yeah, the question of audience is one that I'm always thinking about when I write a new play and I kind of need to know who it's for before I can start. And, um, you know, I think if we are writing plays for our mobs, then that's very different from consciously writing a play for, a, a, you know, a, a non-Indigenous audience. Mm. Um, I think that, I mean, ultimately, I hope that our stories can be for everyone in the way down the track in the future um, that, that yeah. you know, that they they kind of reflect um, a coming together and an understanding um, and a shared sovereignty rather than kind of acquiescing to <laughs> sovereignty of someone else. Um, right. And um, I, I think it's what this mother said. It's it's empowered storytelling. So it's you know not having to ask for permission to tell stories, um, and it's telling the story that you want to tell. Um, yeah. you know, without having to think about whether it's going to be funded or whether it's going to be attracted to a company. It's kind of going, this is the story I want to tell because white fellas can tell whatever they like all the time. <laughs> um, so it'd be great to have that freedom and, and, and to be able to jump around in terms of genre and the way that you write, you know. Um, I think we can so easily be boxed into being a part of a certain kind of story. Um, but, you know, I think that we contain multitudes and we want to tell a variety of different things, you know, mm -hmm. we want to write a silly entertainment, you know, comedy just for black fellas. And then we also want to write a story that maybe is, you know, because we want to um, educate um, another audience, um, but it has to be our choice, our conscious choice to kind of give over any of that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's what I reckon. Amazing. And you, Abby Lee Lewis, what are your thoughts on that? What does the future stories look like and who are they speaking to? Um, yeah, I think I, I, I think we will always um, speak to mob. Like we, we can't not like, we can't not like in, as we take up these spaces in a Western world, in a mainstream world, like, we're always the audience is always going to be us and sometimes or not always but like it, it's it's going to be driven in a way that um yes we might want to educate the white the white narrative but also at the same time um I think there's going to be a place and a space for black people to talk to black people mm -hmm. um I, I you know just looking you look at the history of black theater and and where it comes and where it's it where it started but and there's the thing is it's always been the culture has always been at the heart of it you know ceremony storytelling has always been the seed in the heart of it even in our political stories you know and so um there's this there's this thing that I can I kind of see I kind of see it being um kind of sit like this go mm. like this and then mm. like this again I don't have the words to that that's why I'm talking with my hands uh, weaving so, so weaving I, yeah weaving weaving thank you yeah it's gonna sit like this and I think I think that's okay that's totally yeah. fine um we don't have to fit the big narrative that we've been taught um yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, with the new stories that we're telling, you know, how how important do you think, you know, it is to, you know, to keep our traditional sense of storytelling with the new kind of ways that we tell our stories? Um, how do you think, Delara Williams, that we, you know, may do that? Well, it's all about, like, finding your practice, what Amy was saying about uh, finding mm -hmm. their practice and, and, and how each of we work and, and our values in those spaces so that we don't get lost, especially mm. in those very white dominant spaces mm. and, and or being persuaded to do or lean into their ways or, or yeah, it, it's what I love about Aboriginal theatre is this very um, caring nature of creating mm. um, and I feel like it's that whole thing of like we just hold it with two hands and so graciously um, because 
of how meaningful it is to us no matter it could be just a random story but Mm -hmm. um it's it means so much more and I think it's really learning how to navigate those spaces like we can like fight for a big national um aboriginal theater company where it is run and everything together so we can put um things that we don't always have to explain ourselves and mm. uh, i think it is really creating those spaces and and speaking to these theater companies or film companies and stuff of understanding how to create these safe spaces and, and yeah. these protocols yeah. that then allow us to thrive together because we don't indigenous australia and white australia don't run parallel we are together and so it's then learning or trying to get them into understanding our practices that it's not to um make things difficult or anything like that it's just being very caring because what we've been repeating all day um is what we're doing for mob and what we're doing for elders and country and and knowing our roles and responsibility in these spaces and how powerful mm. words can be because they are they've lasted for 120,000 years yes that, they did and so that's how we are so aware of how powerful stories can go and how long they can last so yeah. I think it's just understanding and learning how to navigate these spaces alongside these non-indigenous companies but they have to be willing to let go and allow us to lead um, in those spaces. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And in that spirit of you know, leadership, I'd like to ask all of you, um, Delara, Abby Lee, Dylan and Amy, you know, just to share something for you know, our other Aboriginal and Tasha Islander emerging artists, you know, emerging storytellers, writers, people who are gonna share culture and share a part of themselves, you know, no matter where they come from in this beautiful country of ours. And we'd like to, you know, what what's something that you would like to share for them to motivate them and to give them inspiration um, through for their storytelling? Uh, I'll go first. Um, your ancestors really do speak through you and support you like you're not alone you're not spiritually alone you're not physically alone ever mob is here always and your story no matter where you're at is needed deeply needed and i am walking proof that that you can survive you can survive through it all and you get to a place where you're surrounded by Dylan's and Abby's and Delara's and Phoebe's and your brothers and sisters who are doing the same thing and make you damn proud and there is a place and there is a space and it is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger so hurry up write your stories come be with us well said okay next um yeah just to go off Amy yeah it's the whole thing of you matter just write it don't worry if spelling or like it's not in the sense of you've been trained and everything record it down use your words use this um to tell your story because it does matter and we want to hear it and we want to share it as well because we all love sharing you know how mob goes on like this we just love sharing stories even though we didn't ask for it yeah Yeah. <laughs> like it's it, that's what it is and um and that's it's we are this is the continuous of culture it's we're just it's m- m- uh, modernizing it is what we're doing now is those ceremonies from 100 plus years ago it's just in a different form like it's painting it's like even though we're using acrylic and canvas which we didn't use that meaning behind it our connection to painting and stuff is still the same and so, yeah, your voice matter, you matter, and we need you here. Yeah. Amazing. Inspiring words. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's great, Delara. Like cr- craft, whatever version of that is, yeah, hone it. It might be, it might be speaking into a, a for I, one for, 
like am, am one to speak to I cannot write in a uh in a form that I've been taught to write in I cannot do it like my imagination doesn't go there what I'm really good at doing is bouncing ideas off of people um listening to people and going oh what if we did this and then what if we did that and then and yeah. and that that's my version of uh storytelling and so I think it's one of the reasons why I've kind of leaned towards acting and um and directing because I find it very collaborative because I can't, I can't sit down at a computer and write words in a narrative way. <laughs> um, yeah. That is not my way to tell a story. And I'm very okay with that. And there are ways to learn that in a Western form. Um, but there are also other forms. There are oh, mm -hmm. of listen to your aunties, listen to your uncles, listen to your nans and your pops and, and, and listen to the way they're talking about it or the way yeah. they're doing it. Um, it might be painting and there's a place for that in the theatre as well, you know, and on screen and and in the visual arts world. Like it might be singing, um, you know, the more and more I um, am and, and learning to uh, learning my own craft of, you know, directing in, in, in that kind of form, the more and more I'm understanding that, um, you know, I want to bring all forms of storytelling to a, a live performance. You know, I want to be able to, um, yeah, in collaborate in, with uh, singers and um, visual artists and set designers and things like that. I think, yeah, yeah. find your craft. <laughs> Amazing. I love that. Find your craft. Um, and I don't have a lot to add. That's all amazing. Um, I would just say, you know, I didn't start writing for a long time because I was waiting, you know, for audiences to change their behavior and want to hear our stories. And I thought I didn't have anything to say, but you actually do. So just write it down, talk their ears off. Um, and there is nothing stronger than the act of telling a story than, than you know, keeping culture alive. So um, every time you do it, every time you pick up a pen, what's coming out is stuff that, you know, you're, you're supposed to say and you're supposed to tell. Amazing. What inspiring um, words from each of you. I think, you know, with this kind of um, energy that we all have, I would love to open it up to the audience that is watching today to ask, you know, a few questions. And um, we don't have that much time left, but I would, I would love to kind of open it up. Does anybody have any, any questions? Oh, we have a comment um, from Desmond Grainer, my father. He said, uh, of course, we need to hear from those close who may not be born Indigenous, but are connected. We get their view on how they see things, which is important to all of us. <laughs> any other, any, any other oh, um, questions? I think that's really great. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Desmond. Yeah, because I... I there's this idea because we've lost so much through colonization that we then become sort of exclusive like we we love sharing and especially that like you can get initiated into other tribes if you are worthy and and yeah. black followers are really good at picking if you you are good in a way we mm. see things beyond that and so yeah to see those people that walk along with us and beside us yeah to see their perspective and stuff is something that I'm really looking forward to yeah I'm just going through the um the questions just sorry just um just quickly okay so we have a question from Adeline um Tio how can we decolonize it on gatekeeping Oh, uh, can I answer this one? Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is one of my favorite questions um, because I'm kind of also decolonizing my own own um, education, um, basically. So I think um, it's using our um, and I think all artists have this our critical analysis on what we've been taught. Um, I think that's the way forward um, because I because I'm practicing that myself um, yeah. and I'm and I'm going okay what have I been what have I been taught and and how do I critically go and, and it, it's a weird weird thing to do but I kind of take myself out of it look at myself look at 
my surroundings and I go, all right, so what if, it's my favorite question, what if we just did it just slightly different? What if we listened in a different way? What if we um, did something uh, that, um, and it's that dreaming thing, right? It's like, yeah. just what if, just what if we had a, um, a, a, a an artistic director that was at Sydney Theatre Company that was a black fella? Whoa, oh my God, that would be amazing. What stories would they tell? Um, you know, what if we had a, a, a board that supported and um, uh, black stories in a main stage? These what ifs, like it's, it's, um, and I feel like everyone can do that. Everyone can ask what if. Um, you know, I, yeah, I think that's the way. <laughs> it might not be practical, but it's definitely a step forward. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. We all need to take a step forward and it's only together that we can actually move forward into the future. Um, we have a question from Jill Jarrett. She asked, what inspires you? Well, I guess I'll answer that. Thanks, Jaleel. <laughs> <laughs> you inspire me, Jaleel. <laughs> that I, I, I think it is. It's culture and mob. I, I listen to stories of family, especially my grandmothers, and what they did and what they fought for um, up in the 60s and uh, the, the political, my grandfather and what he did. And they were all part of like the um, 10 embassy in the seventies and helped establish like medical service, legal service and, and all that. So the activism, the strength and of them just stepping out of line and just going, going for it and that they have a voice. And I was very, timid as a kid and everything and it wasn't until acting that I found my voice and my power and and that really came from my family and what they did um, and it's just another form it's not in the sense of it is a form of activism of course because um, that's what they say it's us being in this space any white space here is a form of activism because they mm. never thought we would be here and so I think a big inspiration is just reminding that we are still here and how far we've come. Um, yeah. That's one of my biggest inspirations. Yeah, definitely. Um, are there any more questions? I'm just going through and just trying to, just trying to find them. Mm. Uh, okay, here's a question. Do you think that there's a space, um, you know, from writers from diverse backgrounds to tell a story, what's it like to have a cross the line um, when you have um, connection with an Aboriginal family and show a different perspective on racism? Yeah, who would like to answer that? Um, I'll have a crack, Dylan. Do you want to have a crack? <laughs> no, no. Um... <laughs> I, so, and, and that's a great question because um, for me, it's, um, I, I grew up with my white dad and my connection to him is nothing but love and, um, you know, and my partner is also um, a white man. And so um, I think it's, I, I felt nothing but love and support from those two men in my lives who are white, who um, society tells is like, tells me is my enemy um you know and and had been well not mine particularly but you know my ancestors they had it had been for a while and so um I I think it's a it it, it has to come from love I think it has to come from um care and intent I think that's the word I think it's intent of why 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 are you telling the story mm -hmm. um and 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 is it a story that needs to be told now? Um, because, um, and, 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 and who's gonna tell that story? Because we've heard that story for a while. And mm -hmm. what if, yeah, what if we give space to people who haven't told those stories yet or haven't had the opportunity to tell those stories? Um, so you get, and that can come from um, so just support, I guess, so supporting the voices that you want to uplift and tell, maybe not take up the space that, that, that they could 
tell <laughs> the space that they could use to tell their story I think so, so. yeah I think. yeah well said um Samia um got goody you have a question you got your hand up I think you're on I think you might have to unmute yourself Okay, here's, here's a question um, from Brooke Webb. Um, she wants to know, how can we foster change in education from teaching practices to encourage decolonization? Can you go into schools or share resources to incorporate your stories into the curriculum as change in education is forerunner of change in our audiences? Well, I know nothing about the education system, but um, what I would say is that um, I think it's so important that, you know, if, if from an institutional government level, we're not seeing those changes in curriculum, which we're not, I think there, is, uh, there are some attempts, um, you know, to, to, to shift in that direction. I think it's actually down to individual teaching practitioners to start to introduce that content in the classroom. Um, there are opportunities to do that. There is flexibility within curriculum from my understanding. And so, um, you know, reach out to, um, you know, local mob, reach out to elders if you're not Indigenous, um, you know, in, invite people into the school, um, look for stories that you that you can um, that you can share and analyse in English classes. You know, Blackfellas have been writing for a long time now. Um, and so, you know, our work's there for, for analysis as well. And you'll find, you know, the same vibrancy and richness of, of themes and so on there. Um, and, you know, if you're a science teacher or you're, you know, teaching in outdoor edge or whatever it's called these days, I'm old now, um, you know, think about Indigenous perspectives and Indigenous knowledges and make sure you're bringing the right people in to kind of to share that um, with students. Um, so empower yourself as a teacher. That's what you do um, to, to make sure that you're doing what you can. Yeah. I, and, and just to echo it echo that like the the curriculum again is um written written down how can you critically analyze your curriculum how can you sit there and go okay um i've been um uh, this is what i've been set to teach my students um hang on a sec what if we looked at the themes um that this is in what if i i took myself out of my own my own knowledge and go okay let's put um a, a, a different perspective on that you know if you've got a theme you know we, I do this all the time with Shakespeare is like you, you've got themes of ambition in uh, Macbeth uh, things like that okay what version of uh, ambition do you want to teach um, for me my version of ambition is a black version so when I go into a in, into a into a classroom um, and I'm running a workshop on Shakespeare I will talk to my own personal ambition and what what cost that has uh, led me and it's been a cultural cost. Um, so there's this, these different ways of attacking your own, your own um, curriculum, basically, what lens and what versions do you want to teach? And look, there are protocols and some things that you just might not be able to yourself teach to or talk to, but there are people around that can help you with that and there are support systems and there are references and there are resources that you can access and bring those people into the room and again create those spaces yeah amazing I think we have um Samia Goody I think that um they were going to ask a question Samia um uh, uh, it, it's okay I accidentally raised my hand when I was trying to go into chat and but now that I've got the unmute I'll just say listening to and seeing younger people and I can say that because now I'm not necessarily an elder but I'm definitely older <laughs> um, it's just really refreshing and um, I've just come home from being in hospital so you've all uplifted my um, heart and feeling um, and spirit enormously and um, but one thing I did want to share is that I think post-COVID and I wrote it that um, especially being in a hospital where no one can have visitors and that really um, is a very different experience to be in a hospital where no one can have visitors um, and how that impacts people and in that institutional setting and then I was out bush with my cousin and, um, you know, with the trees. And I was really reflecting that 
I think we also need to go when we talk about inspiration and connection. I think we really need to get, you know, maybe you all are doing it, but I know I haven't been doing it enough. Um, you know, being outside, really being on country, yeah. really sitting around the fire, you know, like really actually physically going back to that space um, is, I think, really important for us all to start doing again and not just staying in Zoom land and texting and Facebook and even yeah. writing, like just yeah. sitting by the fire and telling stories. Um, you know, like I remember Uncle Jimmy Little, you know, and um, some people may remember him when he was still alive. And, you know, it's a different thing to have seen him playing on stage, but then we'd go back and sit by the fire. And, you know, we're different people when we are in that space. Mm. Um, and not to, I just love that people are thinking about, you know, centering. Like someone said about, um, sorry, about curriculum and I was an associate professor and one of the things I really saw is that we're not a sidebar. We've always been made a sidebar or an elective, you know, yeah. to the mainstream curriculum. But we're the curriculum and, they're, you know, that's the sidebar. And yeah. we don't... I'm, I'm so happy to see younger people seeing that so clearly and that's where we need to go is just cut through that and demand that we're central, you know. Definitely. Not, but just thank you so much to everyone for yeah. being such beautiful faces and talent and heart and just keep being strong and sit by lots of fires. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Samia. Um, you know, we're we're about to uh, finish now, and I just want to say that you know this this conversation that we've had today is an important one. I just want to say that your voices and your storytelling, Abby Lewis, Dela Williams, Dylan Vanderberg, Amy Soul, is important and is important for us to continue doing that type of work and for us to continue doing that into the future. And I thank you for coming today, for taking time out of um, your day to be a part of this panel, this future storytelling panel. And yeah, I just feel very um, inspired. I feel hungry for story. I feel you know motivated and I feel engaged to critically think about the world in a way that is um, you know progressive for our people that is uh, you know for the sustainability of our culture and to really recognize and to to speak truthfully you know we have to speak truthfully no matter how ugly you know our experiences and our ancestors experiences may have been because only truth will um, will set us free and only truth will create a world where you know there's equality in storytelling in you know socially politically so thank you all thank you for um all my family and my friends that and all the other viewers who zoomed in today i know that we are all coming in and zooming in from uh different places around australia and you know a different time um as well some people you know woke up really early for this discussion uh, so I just want to say thank you and that's it. Thank you for attending the Future Storytelling Panel. Thanks so much. Have a great day.